بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد والله إن قطعتم يميني إني أحامي أبدا عن ديني وعن إمام صادق اليقيني The first of our loud salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Second loud salawat in honor of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi wa sallam. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman. Allahumma salli ala. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Why did Umm al-Baneen, the mother of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi al-Salam, not accompany Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on the plains of Karbala. As we know, there were many important ladies who had joined Imam al Hussein alayhi salam from Medina to Mecca, from Mecca towards Kufa, until ultimately being stopped in the land of Karbala. But if there is one glaring personality whose presence Many ask the question concerning why she is not there. One glaring omission in the eyes of some, it's Umm al banin Because we know very well that in the eyes of many today, and in the eyes of many in the past, Umm al banin is seen as one of the greatest women in Islamic history. If you ask any of the lovers of Ahl al-Bayt, alayhum as they'll even go as far as saying that when they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for their hajat, They'll mention Umm al banin as a wasila for that hajjah to be accepted. There are many who will recite salawat for Umm al banin Many who will recite a fatiha in honor of Umm al banin And that comes from the fact that when we see the four sons that she gave away at Karbala, be it Abbas, be it Ja'far, be it for example Uthman or be it Abdullah, You'll see that all of us see that this lady was the very meaning of altruism and sacrifice. But then the question arises that why wouldn't she be there with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? On the first level, reconstructing the biography of such a personality or understanding the reasons as to why they don't come towards a particular event is not easy. Reality is that much of our history has either been the victim of oppression or the victim of even burning. Sheikh Tusi established the Hawza of Najaf simply because of the fact that he had to leave Baghdad and the oppression of the Seljuk Empire and went towards study, went towards teaching in Najaf. In Baghdad, he had a library, a library where there was so much book and there were so many for example, pieces of manuscripts or content that would have allowed us to reconstruct such answers. If you ask many even now in the world, 
if they're able to give you more than five, six stories about the life of someone like Habib bin Madahir, or Muslim bin Awsaj, or Hur bin Yazid al-Riyahi, these great personalities who it's hard to reconstruct their life, let alone the ladies of Ahl al-Bayt, who in many cases, their life was a very private life. It's not like the ladies of Al Muhammad were working in a local store in the city, for example, or were mayors or were counselors, like how you may have in society today. So even when you try to get a reconstruction of the biography of such a person, it's next to impossible to get the reconstruction of that biography. When we look at Umm al banin for example, in our majalis, you'll see that within our majalis, people make it sound like we have many early sources discussing Umm al banin alayhi salam. Reality is, it's only from Ibn Tawus and his Luhuf, the famous Maqtal, onwards, and we're talking the last 500, 600, let's say, years, or even a bit more than that, that you're able to see some more mentioning of Umm al-Banin. Umm al-Banin in the early manuscripts about Karbala, you don't find much about her at all. There are some conversations that you may find concerning, for example, the earlier part of her life, but the majority of her life, you won't find much. And even the return of the caravan from Karbala when they returned to Medina around the 1st of Rabi' or after on the 10th of Rabi' al-Awwal, still these discussions that you find between her and, for example, a man by the name of Bishr bin Hadlam, who even his name we have different opinions on. Is it Bishr bin Hadlam? Is it Hadlam bin Bishr? Is it Hudam bin Bishr? Even within the literature, it's not even clear about the name of that person when it comes to, for example, the one who met Umm al banin and gave her the masaib of Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam. So already from the beginning, reconstructing Umm al banin is not an easy task. A person may look at certain sources, Ibn Tawus, Abu al-Faraj al-Asfahani, later they may see commentaries of some scholars who came in the 21st century or came in the 20th century like al Maqani and others and try and pick up bits and pieces. But the reality remains that why doesn't she come towards Karbala? At the end of the day, Sayyidah Zainab and Umm al-Banin are virtually the same age as one another. Yes, Umm al-Banin and Sayyidah Zainab, I guarantee you that if you look as much as you can within the books of history, you won't find much of a difference between their ages. But one accompanies her brother from Medina to Mecca, from Mecca towards Karbala. From Karbala after Karbala, Sayyidah Zainab goes to Kufa. Sayyidah Zainab goes to Sham. Sayyidah Zainab comes back through Karbala, goes back towards Medina. Then why Umm al-Banin could not do the same things? Why could Umm al-Banin, for example, not have joined when Ahl al-Bayt needed them the most at that time? So this question is a question which is often raised. What could be the possible reasons that the lady stayed behind in Medina. Why did she stay behind with the others? And they were only a minority. Let's make something clear. And that is, there are a number of people who did not come to Karbala who we need to scrutinize in different lectures. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, brother of Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, did not come to Karbala. Why? Kumail bin Ziyad, Dua Kumail, all of you have read Dua Kumail was alive at the time of Karbala, did not come to Karbala. Why? Ibrahim ibn Malik al-Ashtar was alive at the time of Karbala, did not come to Karbala. Why? Qambar, servant of Imam Ali alayhi salam, alive at the time of Karbala, did not turn up to Karbala. Why? Abdullah bin Ja'far al-Tayyar, Sayyidah Zainab's husband, did not turn up to Karbala. Why? So in other words, there are many personalities who did not turn up to Karbala. This does not mean that these personalities are not personalities of reverence or respect. But the reality is that the question has to be asked as to why these personalities were not there or as to why they were not present on the 10th of Muharram. Let's tonight examine as to why Umm al-Banin alayhi salam was not present at Karbala. And let's try and examine this by looking at the different reasons that have been posited. The first reason as to why Umm al-Banin was not at Karbala is a quite obvious historical reason. And that is that they say 
that Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam gave the order for her to stay back in Medina. Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam to Umm Al Banin meant everything because if you look, Umm Al Banin when she married Imam Amir Al Mu'minin alayhi salam married him about 15 years after Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam had died. Umm Al Banin did not marry Imam Ali straight away. Imam Ali, after Fatima al Zahra died, married a Fatima al Zahra's niece. And then after Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam's niece, he married Khawla bin Ja'far. And then after Khawla bin Ja'far, he had also married Asma bint Umayyis, who had a son called Muhammad, son of Abu Bakr, who Imam Ali alayhi salam raised, who was the son of the Khalifa. And then 15 years or so, after Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam died, he married who? He married Umm al -Banin. When he marries Umm al -Banin, Umm al -Banin, her whole life was a dedication to Ahl al-Bayt Whatever Ahl al-Bayt wanted was the priority for Umm al -Banin, Therefore, in her worldview, Imam Ali salam, Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, whatever they say, she submits to a highest level that anyone can ever reach. It's not easy for someone to reach such a level where a person submits to whatever their imam wants. Some of us will always say, for example, Assalamu alaykum ya sahab al asri wa zaman. It'll be interesting when he comes back to see how many of us will submit to him. Because when you see the literature, the literature mentions even those with the highest ilm will be the first to have problems at that time. You can have the highest ilm in the world, but if your ilm is an ilm which is mixed with hasad, or your ilm is an ilm which is mixed with, for example, nifaq. Or your ilm is an ilm which is mixed with a niya that is far away from the path of God. Then will you really submit to the imam when he comes? We only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, when the imam returns, allow us of those to submit to the imam of your time. It's very easy now. Assalamu alayka ya sahib al asri wa zaman. I love imam sahib al zaman. Wallah. If he differs with your worldview on Islam, watch the Shia come chop up. Yes? Shia will jump. If a person differs with their worldview on the religion of Islam, then you'll find that all of a sudden there'll be amongst the Shia those who'll jump and how dare you differ with my worldview and how you, dare you differ with who I admire and who I respect and so on. May Allah bless us that way with the Imam. So Umm al -Baneen, the first opinion was that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when he orders you to stay back, you stay back. That's why they say Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya was ordered by the Imam that he has to stay and look after some of the houses of Bani Hashim, for example. Abdullah ibn Ja'far al Tayyar was ordered to stay back to look after some of the ladies of Al Muhammad. Likewise, Imam al Hussein wants Umm al Banin to stay back for two possible reasons or many. One of them, is that Imam has a daughter, according to certain historical narrations, by the name of Fatima al sughra Yes, many of you have heard of Fatima al-Alila. Yes, that young daughter of Imam al Hussein could not accompany them to Karbala because of her illness. Therefore, who could be there from the ladies who could possibly look after her? Could be Umm al Banin alayhi salam. Stay back with her. Likewise, Abu al Fadl al Abbas alayhi salam left behind a son in Medina who from his line, the line of Abbasi Sadat, for example, or the line of those masters of Abu al-Fadl would continue because Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas had a couple of sons. What's his name? Abu al-Fadl. So one of the sons was called Fadl. And the other son was called Ubaidullah. Ubaidullah was extremely young. Ubaidullah's mother, Lubaba, the wife of Abel Fadl. Lubaba went with who? Lubaba went with Abel Fadl al Abbas to Karbala. Many times you ask people, what's Abbas? Abel Fadl al Abbas alayhi salam's wife's name. Many will not know. Abel Fadl al Abbas' wife was called Lubaba. Lubaba was the daughter of Ubaidullah bin Abbas. She went with Abel Fadl al Abbas where she went with him towards Karbala. When she went with him towards Karbala, she was with Fadl. Ubaidullah, the young baby boy, he remained with who? With his grandmother, Umm al-Banin. So therefore, two duties were there. 
which Imam had wanted on the first level. That Umm al banin stayed behind because there's a baby for Abel Fadl. Of course, some historians have also asked, well, Rabab had a baby. So why couldn't Lubaba take her baby like Rabab took hers? Well, one may argue Rabab's mother or Rabab's mother-in-law, for example, was not necessarily alive. Whereas Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas's wife, Lubaba's mother-in-law was alive. And so you found that the first reason that's given is that Umm al banin stayed behind in Medina because she was to look after Fatima al-Alila. You cannot say Fatima al-Alila will be looked after by the men of that time. She could have been, but there is no one like someone who's seen as a grandmother of the family. Yes? Everybody used to look at Umm al banin as like their grandmother of the family of Al Muhammad at that time because she had been in the house of Ahlul Bayt for over 36 years. So therefore, the first reason was that. A second reason that's given was that Umm al banin السلام, was known as what? A Kilabiyah. The Kilabis had a very high respect in Medina. You know in Medina, there was this covenant where tribes, even today in Iraq, Asha'ir, you hear that there's tribes, even Pakistan, tribes who are confederates or affiliated with each other. When one tribe has a particular let's say, covenant with another tribe, that means anyone messes with yours, they mess with us. You've seen this. If you go to parts of Iraq or you go to parts of Pakistan or you go to Afghanistan, you'll see that there's certain tribal system that you can never change. Those tribes, if they're confederates with one another, they remain loyal to one another. So when they remain loyal to one another, what then happens is that the Kilabis are friends with who? Are friends with people in the land of Medina. So that means Imam al Hussein السلام, knows when I have these ladies one day, they may return back to Medina. I need for there to be someone in Medina during the time I'm away and when I come back who has enough of a tribe that can look after my family when my family returns. When you, look Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, half his marriages in all honesty are political alliances. If you look at the marriages of the Prophet, one could say that his love marriage was Sayyida Khadija alayhi salam. The rest of them, wallah, look at each of them. Political alliance, political marriage, political marriage, political marriage, political marriage, political marriage. It's not like he fell in love with, for example, example. It's not like he fell in love, yes? It's not like he necessarily fell in love with that person. It's rather that he sees that there's a particular alliance that can be achieved. If I marry, this is from Benu so-and-so. And this is from Benny so-and-so. And this is from Benny so-and-so. And this is from Benny so-and-so. So it's better that we make our tribal alliances with one another. Likewise, Imam al Hussein, his marriages, or Imam Amir al muminins marriages, involve political alliances. Why beat around the bush? Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Why do you think he fell in love with Jada, the daughter of Al Ash'at ibn Rabish? Jada, the daughter of Al Ash'at, the son of Rabish, what is he? He's absolute rubbish. His sons are rubbish. Every angle of them is rubbish. Al Ash'at bin Qais and his boys, all of them are the worst of human beings. So what? Imam al Hassan marries from them. Why? Because he loves them. No, political alliance for that particular period of time. Lesser of two evils. Likewise, Umm al banin Banu Kilab, Imam al Hussein, far-sighted vision. If I leave a Kilabiyah in Medina, when my family are still in Medina and I've gone to Karbala, at least there's someone who can soften anyone who might try and attack them. And number two, because Umm al banin was related to who in the generals of Imam and the opposition of the army of Imam al Hussein at Karbala. Who was she related to? Shimr. She was related to Shimr. And you know, if you look on the trampling of the horses on the 11th or the 10th of Muharram, there are people in the army of Imam al Hussein السلام, and people in the army of Yazid who were cousins. Sometimes when they want to trample on a body, some of the cousins would say, wait, wait. That person, we don't like him, we've killed him, but don't trample on his body. Because we are a tribe, that's a disrespect to us. So therefore, 
You found that at that moment they were related how? They were related through her being a kilabiyah. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, a second reason is that he leaves her in Medina so that in her tribal position, she is able to ward off any difficulty that may exist for Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salam. That's the second reason. A third reason is that Umm al-Baneen is an alimah, not just the wife of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Someone says, what do you mean alimah? I ask you all a question. Bibi Fidda was an alimah or no? Sayyida Fidda alayhi salam, servant of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, was she an alimah or not? Have you heard my majlis where I talk and show how Fidda spoke the Quran only? Yes, you've heard that majlis. Fidda alayhi salam, just because she lived in the house of Fatima al-Zahra and Amir al-Mu'mineen, could speak the Quran for the last 20 years of her life, she would only reply with ayahs of the Quran. Imagine reaching that level. That's Fidda. If Fidda is on that level, then you think the wife of Amir al-Mu'mineen is not an alima as well. When she benefits from the ilm of Imam Ali for 14 years of her, their marriage, she's benefiting. Someone says, why is this important? It's important because Imam al Hussein knows that in Medina at the time, there was a group who were vehemently against Ahl al-Bayt Don't forget, Aisha was only dead for over a year or two when Karbala happened. And she had been there when Imam al-Hassan's janaza, when she was one of the most outspoken people in the janaza of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, Aisha had her fair share of the media of Medina. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam wanted to ensure that there was a lady who also had her fair share of the media and the thoughts of the people of Medina at the time. Umm al banin had her voice and those who had supported the other side, whether it was called Uthmaniya or the other ideological groups, they had their opinions. Imam al Hussein leaves Umm al banin alayhi salam as a third reason behind in Medina. For which reason? For the reason being that she could be a voice against the propaganda against Ahl al Bayt alayhi salam. She's not just the wife of Imam Ali, she's an alima. An alima means that Umm al banin is able to explain Imam al Hussein's journey from Medina. To Mecca. She's able to explain the ideology of Ahl al-Bayt, the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt, and what Ahl al-Bayt were doing as well. That's number three. Number four, possibly Umm al banin in herself did not want to go to Karbala to lessen from the duty of her sons, especially Abbas. Why? Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas is virtually on the level of Isma. We agree? So if you say, for example, how some ulama say, that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas has an Asma, say Asma al suhra Let's agree on that. So you see Ahl al-Bayt have the main Asma because they're chosen by Allah. And then you have people like Sayyidah Zainab, people like Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas salam, who have a level of Asma where they are completely pure. Their Asma dictates that they are duteous to their parents and duteous to their Imam. Don't you agree? Will they ever let down their parents? Will they ever let down their Imam? What if there's a clash between the two? What if at Karbala, you have to look towards your mother and you cannot bear to see her thirsty? But then you look at your Imam and your Imam is telling you, for example, to go out and fight at that moment. You're going to have to sacrifice that moment. Maybe a reason is that Umm al banin in her vision, did not want any of her sons to lose their main vision, and that was the khidmah of Ahl al-Bayt And the service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because naturally, if your mom comes with you anywhere in your life, and you have another role on that day, you're always looking at how is mom. Isn't that true? If you have an event at work, or you have a graduation at university, or you have a majlis at home, you may have done a majlis, let's say the gents may have done a majlis for the gents. But you're always asking your mother, are you okay? But you have a duty to those who have come to the majlis. But at the same time, you want to make sure that your duty towards your mother, because you say heaven lies underneath whose feet? The mother. So in a way, Umm al banin may herself have opted not to come towards Karbala. Why? 
because she herself did not want her sons to lose perspective of their duty that day. That lady had raised those sons in which way? That everything in this world, if you want to serve Allah, you must serve Ahlul Bayt salam. Therefore, I come with you. What's going to happen? What's going to happen is that you're going to be thinking, is mom okay? Is Imam Al-Hussein okay? What happens if someone's attacking my mom one side and attacking Imam Al-Hussein another? Of course, Abel Al-Fadh and his mom would have reared him towards that direction that you'd protect Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam. But no mother wants to be in that position where she puts an extra burden on her son or on her sons. Another reason that Umm Al-Banin may not have been at Karbala was because she would have faced the situation of a tribal clash with Shimr bin dil -Joshan. That Shimr, as he already did without Umm Al-Banin being there, said, where are the sons of our relatives here in Karbala? I offer them immunity. You know, that's what he did on the 10th of Muharram. There were two close relations between the opposition. One, Ali Al-Akbar. Ali Al-Akbar, as we know, his uncle is Muawiyah. And his mom's uncle is Muawiyah. His mom's first cousin is Yazid. Yazid and Layla are first cousins. Muawiyah is the uncle of Ali Al-Akbar. So now you have a very tricky dilemma on the 10th of Muharram. Ali Al-Akbar versus the opposition. Opposition are saying, listen, you're from our tribe. We give you the chance for immunity. That moment enraged Ali Al-Akbar. You look at his lines. Many of you have heard them for years. Ana Ali ibn al-Hussein ibn Ali, nahnu wa Allah, and so on. Ali Al-Akbar just blatantly said it. He said, I am Ali, son of Hussein, son of Ali. And I'll strike you the strike of a Hashimi and an Alawi. Wallah, the son of illegitimate birth will never rule over me. Yeah. So you see Ali Al-Akbar on the one side faces this. The same dilemma faced Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam when Shimr came out and said, where are the sons of my sister or my family of the females that are related to us? I offer them all immunity. Leave Hussein. I will protect you. And that, of course, enrages Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. How dare you offer me that you tell me I'll give you security and you leave Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam you think I'll ever leave him? That could be the same for Umm al -Baneen. That Umm al -Baneen did not want to be in that situation where she has to now come face to face with members of her tribe. Maybe Imam al Hussein thought to himself, stay back in Medina. They have nothing on you. You can protect our legacy and you can protect our history where? And you can prote protect our history in Medina. Another answer to this question, why she did not participate? She did. Because in Islam, your niyyah is the most important thing. There are some people who did not help Imam Ali at Jamal because they weren't feeling well. Imam said, was your niyyah to be there? Yes. Then he said that you received the reward because of your niyyah. Umm al banin her niyyah was to be at Karbala. When someone says, why didn't she participate? That makes it sound like participation is only if I'm there. There are some of you, your families could not make it to Ziyara this year. How many of them would have loved to have come? I ask you. Think about your own families. They wish that they could have come Ziyara this year, but they couldn't. Some of them may have been busy. Some safety, some security, some work, some family. They had a niya that if it was my choice, I would be next to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Does Allah take that on board or no? Of course, Allah takes it on board. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it on board very clearly that your actions are governed by your intentions. If a person has a good intention in Islam, he gets one reward. If he acts upon the intention, what does he get? Times 10. If a person has a bad intention, do they get a sin for a bad intention? No. If they act on the bad intention, what do they get? One. Look at the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say Allah wants to send people to hell. I aren't, always use this when someone says God just wants to send you people into hell. Say my Lord tells me if I have a good intention, then I will make sure that with that good intention, I will reward whoever has a good intention.
And whoever acts upon that, I will multiply by 10. Now when a person says, Umm al-Bani was not at Karbala, I'll tell you what, she was not, but her niya was that she wished she could have been. But number two, she was not, but Abbas and his brothers made sure she was. Because if you look at his brothers, and sadly, sometimes I must admit, we focus only on Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, although his was the greatest moment. But we forget that those three other brothers, they all gave their life to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. You look at the other brothers, did they turn around when their brother said, come on, we must make sure that we make our mother, Umm al banin proud? Did they turn around and say, no, I'm not sure, hold back? Not at all. The other brothers who were there, Ja'far and Uthman and Abdullah, each one of them said, we will defend the Imam of our time and we will make our mother proud of our defense as well. And you see them from Bani Hashim, all of them coming out because the upbringing of the mother plays a vital role in how the aqidah is held. Believe you me. Look, we love our fathers, but they don't put as much aqidah as our moms do. Our dads will make sure that socially, we're doing all the boxes, we tick all the boxes of making sure we're in majalis. But your mom, the love of Amir al muminin comes from the milk of your mother. Yes? And that literally, literally applies in the case of Umm al banin and her sons. Literally. That's why when people want to get married, one of the main questions a person has to ask is, do you have that love for wilaya, majalis, ziyara? Of course, some people are Shia, but may not have been blessed yet to have that love of ziyara and of Imam al Hussein. That hadith says, Allah, when he loves someone, instills in them the love of Hussein and the love of ziyara al Hussein. Highest honor. Umm al Banin, her sons highlighted the value of a mother who instills in you that wilaya. That each of those sons came out. And you look at the words of them, especially Abu al Fadl al Abbas highlights that his mom was alive there in Karbala. Wallahi, in qata'tumu yameeni. Do you know when he said this line, when was it? When was it? Normally, if a poet recites poetry, let's say in a Mawlud or in a Jashan somewhere, that person is in a very nice environment, food and drinks are being given out, everyone's enjoying themselves. But Umm al banin raised her son that he's able to recite poetry while he's lost his right arm. Uh, tell me, what level is that? Imagine you've lost an arm. What's the first thing the human being does when they are injured? Injured, and when I say injured, by the way, say, for example, you now, your finger has pressed something and now the finger's broken. You're still here in anguish. No one's going to recite poems at that time. Unless you've reached a level of yaqeen in your life where you look at death as nothing but a bridge to a greater place. Wallahi in qata'tumu yameeni. Inni uhami abadan an deeni. Wallah, if you cut off my right arm, I'll forever defend my religion. And who? And defend an imam who is truthful and certain. The grandson of the Holy Prophet. Imagine bleeding completely and his aqidah was not wavering. You can put arrows in me. You could do what you want. They cut off their left arm. The left arm, gone. Me and you, left arm gone, right arm gone. That would be the end. Screaming, anguish. Ya nafs, la takshay min al-kuffar. Nafs, don't be scared of the kuffar. It's okay. Ya nafs, la takshay. Get ready for the glad tidings of the Jabbar. You're going to be in a moment with the chosen prophet of Allah. Look at my arms, they've gone. Doesn't worry me, I'm going to meet Rasulullah soon. This world, as Imam al Hussein said, if bodies are meant to die and decay, then let my body be cut into a thousand pieces. At the end, it's the soul that continues. The body, it will go. But your soul, your shakila on the day of judgment, what is it? Is it of somebody who had the aqaid and the love with character? Then you saw Abbas. Ya nafs la Explain to me. I've never understood 
how a human being, while he's bleeding, can recite these lines. Doesn't make any sense to me. Unless you had a mother like his mother. And even that moment with the water was all his mom, not him. When he picks up the water and then he remembers his master, Hussein, that's his mom's upbringing. Even when he tells Imam al Hussein Sayyidi and never calls him Akhi, that's his mother's upbringing. How dare you say to Abu Abdullah, brother, Abu Abdullah is master. You never say to him, brother. That's all the upbringing. So was Umm al banin at Karbala? Yes, she was. It was embodied in her sons. I'll give you an angle to look at this point. And that is that this lady, without a doubt, when a person asks why Imam didn't take her, I'm going to give you my own angle. But it's an angle which comes on an emotional level of why Imam may not have taken her. Maybe the Imam had seen the loss of one mother in Medina. He didn't want to lose another in his life. Please understand this delicate angle. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had lost one mother. <coughs> and not just lost his mom, he saw her injured. Yes. Take your hearts to Baqiyah. This is Baqiya tonight. This is us returning to Medina. If you want to go to Medina. I don't know how many of you miss Medina or no. <coughs> but Imam al Hussein alayhi salam saw his mother injured in front of him. And it's as if he knew that some of the ladies of Al Muhammad would be injured as well. He couldn't bear to see another mother injured in his life. He had seen his mom when he was only seven, eight years of age with a door smashed on her. That broke his heart. He didn't want to see another mother figure in his life with horses hitting her or with chains all over her. He could not take this idea that I lose two moms in my life and I see two moms tortured and I see two moms injured. No, no. I'd rather know that I left this world and the lady that became my adopted mom did not get injured in front of me like my real mom got injured in front of me. Remember for Ahl al-Bayt, it was hard to recover from the injury of Fatima al-Zahra salam Many of us don't realize that Imam al Hussein had to live for years just remembering the burning of that house and remembering the attack. And you know what the poet says? The poet says an extraordinary line. He said, we thought in Medina was the only fire. We thought Medina was the only fire we were going to see. And yet we saw the tents in Karbala. And we thought in Medina, there was only one rib that was to be broken. Then we saw Hussein on the earth of Karbala. We thought in Medina that we saw a baby being killed. Then we saw the six-month-old again in Karbala. We thought in Medina that was the only slap we'd ever see. Then we saw the slaps of the ladies of Al Muhammad. All of what happened to Fatima al Zahra, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam did not want to see happen to Umm al Banin, and that's why some ulama they go towards a conclusion, whether it's mystical or not, that on the on the day of judgment. The mother swap positions. Fatima becomes Abbas's mom. And Umm al Banin becomes Hussein's mom. <laughs> Bid farewell tonight, those of you who are returning. These are the nights. In the same way that Al Muhammad bid farewell when they were going to return home. Day of judgment, one mother comes holding two hands. Says, my Abbas. And another will say, my Hussein. That's the devotion that was there. Did Umm al banin know that Abbas and his brothers had been killed in Karbala before Bishr bin Hadlam? Yes, she did. 100% she knew that they had been killed. Why? Because you all know the story of the Qarura. You know, the Qarura is like that bit of sand that was given to Umm Salama. 
the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa where Rasulullah said that when this sand becomes blood, turns red, then know that Hussein has been killed. The moment Umm Salama was sitting on Ashura day, and Umm Salama and Umm al Banin and all of them were close, of course, they're all one family. Umm al Banin, Umm Salama saw the Qarura turn, they knew. But the extent, they didn't know. The extent. So when ulama say that Bishr bin Hadlam or Hadlam or Hudam bin Bishr, whatever the name is according to different historians, some ulama try and portray it as if it's the first time she heard. No, she knew. But a mother can find out about the loss of her child. It's different when you read the life of that child back to the mother. A mother can find out that her child's died, but it's only when she approaches the reality of his death that she breaks down even more. Umm al banin knew her sons had died, but nobody had ever announced it directly to her. You know, sometimes you may have a scholar they say to you that that scholar is in prison. You don't know, has the pris has scholar died in prison? Or could he still be alive? Or you don't know where the scholar could be, but you know that he's not around anymore, but you're still uncertain. You still want that one day of confirmation that it's done. That's where I think, if anything, Ibn Tawus' narration about Bishr bin Hadlam, maybe from there comes the angle that Bishr wasn't the first to tell her about the deaths. But rather when he announced it, it became so real for her. That now no longer will I see those who I love. And that's why when he came, another aspect is that some say she tried to move people so that she goes and asks him, tell me, tell me what happened. Tell me. No, 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 no. Umm al banin is class. Umm al banin will not push people. When you go and want to hear a piece of news, you wait your turn. People say that she went and moved others and said, tell me about what happened. In no, no, no. The lady stayed there. Some have the opinion that there might have even been a cover between her and the man announcing. It was like, let's say, the first majlis in honor of Karbala. Yeah. And Imam Zain al abidin was coming and she was waiting her turn. He was talking about Karbala and the details of Karbala. And then she began to hear slowly what had happened. I remember reading, there is a scholar by the name of Shajari. He has a book called The Amali. He mentions that there's a lady who was alongside the family of Rasulullah, alongside Zain al Abidin. Zain al Abidin says for five years after Karbala, wouldn't stop crying. And there was a lady who cried so much with him that when she died a few years after Karbala, by that time she had become blind from how much she cried. He mentions her name as Umm Ja'far al Kilabiya. He doesn't say Umm Abbas. He says Umm Ja'far al Kilabiya. Now, some ulama, when they look at that, what do they say? They say that that must be Umm al Banin. That when she heard what happened at Karbala, she lost her eyesight at the end of her life. Because imagine us who have not met Hussein, never met Akbar, never seen Qasim never seen the baby, never seen any of them, and we, our heart breaks a thousand years later. Imagine you saw them grow up. Imagine you saw them in your house. Imagine you saw the smile. Imagine the young daughter of Imam al Hussein. Imagine the others, yes? So that Umm al banin Bishr bin Hadlam had come, and when he came, he said, we have the confirmation of the news from Karbala. She made her way closer and closer to him. When she got closer to him, she looked towards him. Mama Qani narrates this as an authentic tradition. She got closer and closer to him until she said to him, may you give me the news about Karbala. The reply came, may Allah give you patience over the death of your son Ja'far. She replied, tell me about Aba Abdullah. Allahu Akbar, he's telling you your son has been killed. No, 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 no. Those are now Fatima's sons. I want to know about my son. Tell me about my son. Yes. 
May Allah give you patience and reward over the death of your son Abdullah. She said, tell me about Aba Abdullah. May Allah give you reward and patience over the death of your son Uthman. She said, tell me only about Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Look at the height of love, yes? He then said to her, May Allah reward you over the death of your son Abbas alayhi salam. She was carrying the baby of Abbas. She fell with the baby on the ground because she couldn't take hearing the name of Abbas being killed. She then got up. She said, tell me, tell me, tell me about Hussein alayhi salam. The poet says, it's as if she said, if you gave me all the heavens and you gave me all the earth and you gave me 70 Abbas, I'd swap all of them to see the head of Abba Abdullah in peace. When she heard the news, what did she do? She left the mosque in Medina. She had only one place she wanted to go. A lady she had not seen for a while now. She wanted to go and visit her. But that lady, Zainab, had made it clear to Fidda. Fidda, I don't want to see anyone now that I've come back from Karbala. Fidda, allow me to rest in peace. Anyone who comes, tell them to come on a different day. The door all of a sudden knocked, yes? When that door knocked, Fidda came towards the door. She opened the door. It was Umm al -Banin. What does she do? She turned around to Zainab alayhi salam. She said to her, Sayyidati, you said to me, don't welcome anyone. She said, yes. She said, but it's Umm al at the door. Zainab ran to the door and Umm al ran to Zainab. This is your lines tonight. Show your love for Zainab. Show your love for Umm al -Baneen. This is a night of Hajat for you. The night of Arba'een, yes? Zainab ran towards her and Umm al ran to Zainab. One of them calling out, Wa Husayna, and the other calling out, Wa Abbas. They both came, they embraced each other, they hugged each other, the tears were flowing. She kept asking her about Karbala. Can you imagine Zainab narrating Karbala to Umm al -Baneen? How do you tell a mother that your son's arms both went? How do you tell a mother an arrow was stuck in his eye? How do you tell a mother that he fell from his horse without any arms? But they had one more thing to do. What was it? There was still a girl in Medina, yes? That girl, they both had to go and tell her the news because that girl every day would be asking, is my brother Akbar back or no? Is my baby brother back or no? Is my cousin Qasim back or no? Is Sukaina back or no? That Fatima would keep on asking. Imagine when they walked into her. You know the first thing that that Fatima did? She looked at Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab looked at her. Fatima looked at her. She said, who are you? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. What had Karbala done to Zainab? Who are you? Who are you? She said to her, you don't recognize me. She said, who are you? Tell me, who are you? Do you have any news about my father or my auntie? Allahu Akbar, who's she talking to? She said to her, I'm your auntie. She said, tell me, where's my father? Where's my uncle Abbas? Tell me, where are they? Imagine how she broke the news to her. Your father we left in Karbala. Your uncle we left by the Furat. She said, tell me then about my baby brother. Where is he? Surely they couldn't kill a six-month-old baby. Sayyidah Zainab at that moment had one final task. Umm al she had seen. And she had now seen Fatima al sughra She now had to go to her house. Any mother that returns from her journey cannot wait to see the bedrooms of her sons. Imagine for her when she entered, she saw the empty mattresses of Aun and Muhammad. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. 
Let's raise our hands, my dear brothers and sisters. Ya Allah, raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib Al Asri Wa Zaman. Ya Allah, accept our amal in these nights. Raise us with the Imam of our time and bring unity in the Ummah of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Let's all recite this dua one final time, all of us together. May Allah bless the organizers of this majlis from Spiritual Journeys and all the other groups who are part of our group, part of our family who have joined us and taken their time to come to our majalis and at the same time brought members of their groups with them. May Allah bless your groups as well. Let's all recite the ayah of the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Amma yujibu al-muthar idha da'a أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا 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 يا الله accept our زيارة this year allow us to return safe and sound to the land of Karbala يا الله يا الله bless this country allow its people to live in peace and prosperity bring them happiness يا الله and remove all the trials and tribulations from the people of Iraq and all the followers of Muhammad and Al Muhammad wherever they may be. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all those who are feeling unwell in our communities. In the name of Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam, Ya Allah, cure them. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the marhumin who have been part and parcel of instilling the love of Ahlul Bayt in our lives and the marhumin of the organizers of this majlis with a surah al-Fatiha. But before it, the loudest of your salawah.